Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome. My name's Isabella Robbins. Uh, I'm very excited to have you all here with us. Um, I am associated with the Chapter House in many different ways, including serving on the board. Um, I'm also a second year PhD student at Yale University in the Department of the History of Art. Um, and I'm very excited to have you all here and to host this uh, film screening and Q&A with uh, three fabulous artists who we'll hear more from shortly as well as view their films. Um, and we'll actually be viewing four out of the three, uh, we'll actually be viewing four films that are featured in our exhibition, But When You Come From Water. Um, so just as a brief introduction, if you're joining us for the first time, uh, welcome. We're very excited to have you here. Um, if you have been a part of our programming in the past, welcome back. Um, also excited to have you here. Um, we are the Chapter House. Um, while we can't physically come together during this pandemic, uh, we at the Chapter House are providing a virtual space for Indigenous peoples, allies, and accomplices to appreciate art, convene, and collaborate, celebrate individual and shared Indigenous cultures, and explore the complexities of 21st century Indigenous experiences. This is a space for empowerment and community, but all who share a desire for universal empowerment are welcome here. Um, and with that, if you haven't already been following us on our social media, um, we'll be dropping banners here and there. Make sure to do that. We are at the Chapter House LA um, across most platforms. Um, and yeah, make sure to follow us on Instagram. We're close to a thousand followers and would love to get there uh, this week, which would be very exciting. Um, so yeah, again, if you're joining us for the first time, this is our first programming associated with the exhibition, But When You Come From Water. Um, Water is life, a rallying cry of indigenous peoples and a true plain and simple fact. But what exactly does it mean to come from water? In her poem, Atlas, uh, where this exhibition draws its title from, Teresa Siagatonu ponders the realities of being from Samoa, an island in the South Pacific, very often overlooked on maps, and that is victim to colonization, tourism, and American military imperialism. For Siagatonu, water is, a place, is the place where she is from, in part because it threatens to overtake what little land makes up Samoa, but also because the ocean's vastness is easier to see than the island. As water surrounds her homelands, how might water shape other places we are from? From the Navajo Nation to Sub-Saharan Africa to California, water scarcity, the lack of running water and drought make everyday tasks a help everyday tasks and health a challenge, including COVID-19. On the other hand, abundance of water like post-Hurricane Katrina um, or the Kiribati Islands threaten to swallow the very existence of a physical space. In both instances of too little or too much water, water structures are homes, physical me and mental health and lives. In the Chapter House's online exhibition, um, but when you come from water, we invited artists to contribute works that consider water as a material, medium, inspiration, and something to fight for. This exhibition is specifically inspired by the work of Emma Robbins, the Chapter House's founder and director of the Navajo Water Project, as well as new mom and my sister. Um, in conjunction with World Water Day when the exhibition opened, um, and in collaboration with Dig Deep Water, but When You Come From Water explores interpretations of water in artistic form from artists across the world. And without further ado, I'm very excited uh, to introduce the first film and artist who will be looking at, um, again, one of the four artists we have in the exhibition who are working with film and video um, and the moving image. And that is Mateo Vargas, they, them, theirs. Um, they are a queer, non-binary Mexican-American filmmaker and visual artist whose multimedia work focuses on the intersections and fractures of identity, borders, and diaspora under the dual legacies of colonialism and late-stage capitalism. Their video art has screened in festivals and galleries in the United States, Mexico, Japan, Colombia, Cuba, Argentina, Germany, Greece, Italy, France, and the United Kingdom. 
Their film, Aguas Negras, Black Waters, or Sewage, is an experimental documentary about the Cuauhtuflan River that runs through the state of Mexico. The film examines the passage of time and the pollution of the river by focusing on conversations with multiple generations of women that have grown up on its banks. Um, and I'm realizing that I did not mention this first, but we will be viewing the films first um, before we move into a Q&A. Um, and we will start with Aguas Negras. Thank you. ¿Qué tal amigos del periódico Iscali? Buenas tardes. Me encuentro eh, a las orillas del río Cuautitlán, a la altura de la colonia Santa Rosa de Lima, límites con el fraccionamiento San Antonio, en donde hace unas horas vecinos de estas comunidades que caminan por aquí reportaron a las autoridades municipales el hallazgo de un cuerpo sin vida, el cual lamentablemente pues se encuentra flotando en las aguas de este cuerpo de agua. Yo aquí nací, tengo 76 años. Pues estaba más limpia el agua, ahí íbamos a lavar y al íbamos agua de allá para bañarnos. Pues estaba muy bonito porque había, el agua pasaba muy clarita. Y íbamos ahí a agarrar pescado porque pasaban unos pescados bien, bien bonitos y... Eso los comíamos muy sabrosos. Llevábamos de comer, pues ya comíamos y juntábamos los capulines, y ahí andábamos muy a gusto. Y después no, ya todo corrió, ya ni los árboles existen, ya todos los tiraron. Ya no hay nada de eso. De donde venía esa agua, de la presa de Guadalupe que se llama, esa agua venía de allá, esa agua estaba limpiecita. Y era la presa, era lo que pasaba aquí en el río. Y este, y no, ahorita ya no, esa presa ya está, la van a secar. 
como 50 años que ella empezó a pasar agua sucia, ya no, ya no sirvió para bañarse ni para lavar la ropa, ya no, pura agua de drenaje. Llevo mis 19 años viviendo en esta comunidad. Cuando iba en la secundaria, prepa, se encontraron cabezas de personas ahí, abandonadas, dentro del carro. Estamos muy cerca del río y nadie escuchó nada. ¿Qué fue lo que pasó? Porque eran personas que decapitaron. Creo que ese río para mi hermano le tiene muy marcado porque él, siendo muy pequeño, perdió a su papá ya que él se fue a ese río. Si le pegaron o lo mataron y lo fueron a echar con el carro, en el, ahí lo comentaron en el... En el río, ese, esa vez llevaba muchísimo agua, el río iba llenito. Y ahí estaba Ajá. el carro, y yo le iba adentro, ya estaba muerto. Y, y, y con trabajo lo sacaron. Y pues, el coche también lo sacaron, pero les costó pues, sacarlo. Y a él, porque pues, él estaba cerrado, fíjate. Pues fue raro, ¿no? Porque estaba cerrado el carro y dice que tenía el seguro por dentro. Y él ahí muerto adentro. Pero... Yo me imagino como que se ¿no? Pues aventaron el carro ahí en él. Nuestra comunidad, bueno, aquí en el Estado de México estaba lloviendo demasiado, que eran lluvias diario. El río Cautitlán estaba a punto de desbordarse. Si se llegara a desbordar desde por allá, donde Federico se hubo, si nos tocaba a todos por aquí, nos tocaba a todos, bueno, el agua se venía bien fuerte. En las comunidades más cercanas, y sí, era de 
¿saben qué? Díganle a sus papás que guarden todos sus documentos importantes en bolsas. Eh, tengan ustedes y su familia una mochila con ropa. ¿Por qué? Porque no sabemos en qué momento vaya a desbordarse y tendremos que subir inmediatamente a los techos para que no alcance el agua a, a nosotros. Entonces, sí era una situación que a todos nos tenía como con mucho miedo de pensar que fuera a pasar. de tu vida no, todo esto que cambio ya no, no para, bueno para mí ya no, ya no es bueno porque es pura basura, pura contaminación para todos eso ya no, a mí no me no me gusta, y es lo que yo quisiera que mis nietos me pues que me escucharan y que eso pues, lo guardaran como un recuerdo que yo les sé para todos mis nietos y mis bisnietas que están que conocí porque pues, nos vamos a morir y o sea, pues, podemos dejar de recuerdo más que eso sí, sí.
just keep it rolling and go on to the next uh, video we'll be looking at. Um, okay, so next we'll have The Waves by Kayla Anderson. Uh, Per Purse is an artist, writer, and caretaker who loves to spend time staring intimately into the eyes of insects. She uses video to trace connections between people, places, and things with the hope that art can perform work on our social and cultural imaginaries, expanding the realm of, of the possible and making tangible ways of seeing and being in with the world. Her work has been shown at various artist run spaces in the US, Australia, and Vietnam. Her writing has been published by Leonardo Journal, MIT Press, Art and Education, Aperture Magazine, and uh, Temporary Art Review, and Clint Slitched. The Waves um, will be seeing three clips uh, that Kayla has picked out for us. Um, and you can watch the entire film on our exhibition page. Um, so without further ado, let's view these clips. You are here because of others who are not like you. Others who believed in a certain myth, a myth of separation. The separation between your body and mine. The separation between body and mind. The separation 
between body and soul. A myth of hard edges, of borders, a myth of forests without people, of trees without roots, of ground without soil. You. you are here because of others who are not like you. Others who believed in a certain myth. A myth of separation. The separation between your body and mine. The separation between body and mind. The separation between body and soul. A myth of emptiness. Of inert material. A myth of the body as an impenetrable shell. This is a story of possession.
you are attuned to fluctuations and incremental change. But you know better. Your skin is a system of tiny pores. Your boundaries are shifting, traversable. Del cielo cae agua, lluvia poderosa. Lávame la mente con agua fría Y saca la pena de mi memoria De mi memoria You look back into the eyes that watch you. You see what cannot be surveyed.
Your questions have the power to unravel. Your desires have the power to build. that force fields are impermanent. But sometimes, you create them anyway. Okay, next um, we will be viewing Undark by Jeremy Bolin, who is an artist, researcher, organizer, and educator interested in site-specific site experimental modes of documentation and presentation. Much of Bolin's work involves rethinking systems of recording, in an attempt to observe invisible presences that remain from various scientific experiments and human interactions with the Earth's surface. His work has been exhibited at numerous locations across the US and abroad, um, and Bolin currently lives and works between Chicago and Atlanta, serves as assistant professor of photography at Georgia State University, and is co-founder and co-organizer of the D Deep Time Chicago Collective, and is currently represented by Andrew Rafus Gallery in Chicago. Undark, um, oh, and I should mention that, unfortunately, Jeremy couldn't join us today, um, but we still will be viewing his film, Undark. Um, between 1922 and 1936, the Radium Dial Company and U.S. Radium Corporation hired thousands of young women in Ottawa, Illinois to paint the faces of watches, clocks, and other instrument dials using a new glow-in-the-dark radioluminescent paint made of phosphorus and radium. The name of the paint was Undark. Famously, the girls worked in an old high school building. They had been told the paint was safe, picture them licking the paintbrush to make a perfect point for a particularly detailed job, even painting their teeth with the stuff when they got bored at work. Picture them painting their fingernails with it, looking at them under bed covers at night. The women, there were 4,000 of them, have been memorialized as the radium girls. The stories of how the corporations convinced doctors to cover up their deaths are appalling, but not surprising. The Radium Girls have captured our cultural imagination at different times where they have stood for labor rights, the human cost of technology, and the toxic toxicity of the unknown. What hasn't captured our imagination is what became of the actual place of Ottawa, Illinois, <coughs> Excuse me, where the radium still lingers, through, though invisibly in daily life. The Radium Dial Company was demolished and used as a landfill and like any other substance in a landfill, radium has leaked into the ground in nearby Illinois and Fox Rivers. Today, Ottawa is a sea of national priority list toxic sites, all in various states of remediation, all still contaminated. 
Undark includes footage of the Fox River filmed from National Priority List Site 7 in Ottawa, a collection of clocks that were painted with the Undark paint at the Radium Dial Company and various sections of cement, tile, and brick from the Radium Dial Company that were found on the banks of the Fox River. Seeking to reignite and understand these artifacts, they are ignited by large bursts of light to help recreate the lost glow and forgotten unresolved energy that still emanates from these materials. So let's view the film now. Great. So next up, we have our last uh, video work, and it's coming from Jody Lynn Mar Maracle, 
uh, who was born and raised in what is currently considered Buffalo, New York. Jody Lynn is a Ganeyagaga. I'm sorry, I probably didn't say that right. Um, teacher, excuse me. Uh, mother, artist, teacher, and language learner. Excuse me for that. Jody utilizes Haudenosaunee material language and techniques such as hand tanning deer hides and corn husk twi twining in conversation with soundscapes, projections, video, and performance to interrogate questions of place, power, erasure, story making, and responsibility to the land. She has shown her work through Dish with One Spoon territory, uh, throughout Dish with One Spoon territory in site specificity specific installation performances, such as the Mush Hole Project at the Mohawk Institute Residential School, home of the Woodland Culture Center in Brantford, Ontario, as well as the Gardner Museum in Toronto, Ontario, Ontario Art Park in Lewiston, New York, uh, and Silo City in Buffalo, New York, Birchfield Penny Art, Art Museum in Buffalo, New York, and Squeaky Wheel Film and Media Art Center in Buffalo, New York. Her scholarly research focuses on Haudenosaunee material culture, language, land, and birth practices. Of her accomplishments, she is most proud to hear her child speak their Mo Mohawk language every day. Um, the work we'll be viewing is A Song to the Water from a Loving Child, which arises from a sweet moment with the artist child who, upon throwing stones, pebbles, and whatever they could grab into the water, declared, it's beautiful music, a song for the water. This piece is the artist's response to this loving child, a moment of hard truth, a moment where we know gratitude is not enough. Water is the lifeline for Dosawe, currently known as Buffalo, New York, since time immemorial before the arrival of Europeans, through ungrateful in industrialization and into today, the water, the Great Lakes, her rivers, stream, her rivers, streams, and creeks have sustained this place currently known as Buffalo, New York, and many communities along these freshwater lifelines. Through reservoirs of land theft and projects eagerly backed by the Niagara River Power Authority to the construction of the St. Lawrence Seaway, we witness not only the loss of water we could touch, drink, eat from, but thousands of lakers of land. Rivers turned to rivers of fire, so toxic they burn. These waters make life possible. And what do we have left to give her but our gratitude and apologies and songs?
Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, now we're going to sort of transition into doing the Q&A portion um, for Jody Lynn's work and um, Kayla's. We did not see the full videos, but I just want to remind you that if you'd like to view all these films in their full length, you can do so on our website on the exhibition page. Uh, but when you come from water, um, thechapterhouse.org, you can get to all those things pretty easily. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to bring in Mateo, Kayla, and Jody Lynn. Great. Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome. Thank you so much for sharing your beautiful work with us um, and you know contributing to our exhibition, which is also our first exhibition, um, which is very exciting. Um, and yeah, I'm just happy that we all got to see and experience your beautiful works. Um, so to start, I'd kind of, you know, of course, invite you to also just introduce yourselves a little bit more. Uh, anything that is missing from your bios that you'd like to add on, definitely. Um, include that, but I'd also just like you to, I'm on a very busy street in LA and people are also loud. Um, sorry about that. But yes, as I was saying, I'd like you to also just, you know, speak a little bit more or speak to um, maybe the relationship that you see between film or video or the moving image and water in your works. Um, obviously that's what unites us all here today. Um, and I think you've captured sort of the essence of the exhibition in your works beautifully um, in very different ways using a similar meeting, medium and would love to know more of, more about that. So I, I can choose someone to start or, <laughs> or we could just start with Mateo since uh, their work was first. Yeah, so I feel like there's a definitely uh, overlap of a sense of like the animacy of water um, throughout all of these works and like the memory that is like um, tied to it. And I think that's definitely something that's really like, it's really great to see that kind of like confluence, like everyone's kind of thinking of that. Um, I know for the documentary I did, that's definitely like, that was the main like goal of it was to try to like if a river could talk what would it tell us about the land about the people about the history um how does memory function with water specifically um like who is controlling um access to water who is controlling pollution who is doing all these kinds of things so yeah i definitely felt this sense of like um uh, the importance of water specifically and how it is an entity in, in and of itself. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's uh, super interesting. And I think, um, you know, as the chapter house for like an indigenous arts organization, and I think something you hear a lot is how like, you know, native peoples are sort of like trying to be the voice um, for those that can't speak. And I think, that's really interesting. And it reminds me too of like conversations around making like water politically, like making water a person or a being that needs to be protected, which I think is fascinating. And I think art, in my opinion, is probably the more like ethical, uh, like non neoliberal way to do that, which I think is really interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, why don't we swing on over to Kayla? Yeah, I can. Um, yeah, that was really nice. Mateo and I, yeah, it was nice to see. I mean, I had watched the works before, but it's nice to see them like in a row like that. Um, yeah, I mean, my film, uh, which I'm like so happy to share with you, you all in this way. So thank you, uh, Isabella and the Chapter House. Um, but it it's about, it started out being about a different kind of wave, um, which was millimeter and microwaves um, mm. used in cell phone technologies. Um, now I sound like a conspiracy theorist, um, but at the time there were a lot of scientists and there still are a lot of scientists who are trying to protest 5G and other technologies for the way that they interact with our bodies and also the bodies of other animals and plants. Um, and so the film started 
from that and the characters wear these protective garments, but then I wanted to instead focus on waves that are not like insidious <laughs> uh, and that are healing instead. And so um, Lake Michigan ended up becoming a big character in the film. And I know I showed a lot of like different clips um, from it, but two of the two of the people who it follows live right next to the lake. And so, and it was during, it was filmed in, I guess like October through January of this past year. And so one of the, one of my friends and the characters, Kevin um, lives in this little kind of apartment um, area where because of his immune deficiency, he wasn't leaving the courtyard. So it was like his, uh, entire relationship to the world became like the lake um, with this like rocky border. Um, and Anya, um, one of the other artists has this really long painting practice with the lake of painting outside every day or multiple times a day. Um, and then um, the other person or character, Zhao is in the same city, but quite far from the lake, but then a lot of their life because they're a gardener is about like how the city uh, parses out water. Um, and so, yeah. Um, but yeah, there were things in both of your films where I was like, um, like, oh, the Katie did who's looking at the fire or all these things I just really loved. Um, that I think that there's a way in which we can, I mean, it obviously doesn't work exactly, but with film or video we can have others see the world in ways that we see it or cer certain ways. Um, and yeah, so anyway. Yeah, one thing I specifically liked about yours too, or thought was interesting too, is you kind of have like these layers of art and things like that, because I was thinking of the the painted images that you had and that you were that were flashed to and stuff like that. Which I thought was very interesting. Um, yeah, awesome. Let's uh, head over to Jody. I think with um, my piece, like I grew up in Buffalo, and so everything was very much informed by my relationship to this city that is on Lake Erie. And like at the time that I made this, Buffalo is going through like a big resurgence of like the waterfront. So previously it had just been, you know, there's steel mills, there's auto industry, like it was just kind of a dumping ground, like a lot of waterways become. And so now like the revitalization is around like, um, you know, things like, you know, bars on the waterfront, things like jet skiing, things like boating, right? And we still have like a dead zone in Lake Erie and we still have like massive E. coli outbreaks so you can't touch the water, right? Like you know, you're on the beach one day and then they're like, everybody out, right? So it's like literally a toxic, tenuous relationship. But like, for me, it was always this, this rhythm, this quiet meditative space, right? This, this, um, I like this, the animacy of it, right? It's like this, this entity I'm encountering unto itself. And originally this was a three channel video installation. And in the middle, there was like some, um, found objects in concentric circles along with like our traditional corn flour, corn husks and like salt rings um, and a stool that had been my grandfather's when he was a child in the middle. And this installation was in the midst of a very busy art party at this location. And I think that that also like was that tension I was playing with, right? Is like, where's this space for relationship? Where's this space for quiet? Where's the space for respect? Um, and then the the outfit I'm wearing, the underdress is made of treaty cloth. So from a treaty with Seneca, well, I got it from uh, my partner's family who's Seneca. Um, and I kind of been performing as this character version of myself in this dress made of treaty cloth because it's one of the few obligations under these treaties that the U.S. has upheld is to give this muslin every year to families. And I think that that's important to me, too, is because when we talk about relationship to place or land, we can't like ignore the nation state. 
and the ways in which, you know, our undisturbed use and enjoyment of these places we're responsible to are completely under assault in that way. Um, and I don't have a neat bow on the end, so I'll just stop talking and mute myself. It was a beautiful hand bow. Yeah. No, I think, yeah, that's a really good point. And I was curious too about um, your, how you kind of what the ideal scenario to view this work was in from all of you, because like you mentioned, like it was supposed to be a three channel work and um, that's kind of how I envisioned it. And I remember like watching this for the first time, like I was just, it was like the weird, it was a weird part of day. I mean, it was like twilight and I was like watching this video on the film and I was like, I feel like this is maybe the vibe they were going for. Um, in this work. So I, yeah, I'd love to hear from the other artists what, you know, what would be the ideal scenario to view these works? Also, maybe how has the pandemic, um, you know, changed how you create artwork or changed your relationship to water? I know that's been a huge thing, um, specifically for the Chapter House founder. So much of their work has been trying to create, um, and I'm talking about Emma Robbins, but trying to create, you know, how do we, what's the most efficient way to wash hands? Mm -hmm. Um, while being in quarantine, how does this, you know, intersect with her art, things like that? I'd love to know a bit more. And I, I would love to keep my sound off, but as you heard before, there's honking and yelling and whatnot. Um, so I, I feel like ideally, uh, this work that it, um, ideally, you know, with any kind of video work, it's really nice to have it in a physical space, either like projected in a gallery or theater, anything um, with a group of people or where you can physically kind of just be there and absorb what you're watching. But um, it also, I think, is um, something I've thought about too, where now like digitally you can um, it's almost like the pandemic opened up more of a accessibility to everyone. So like, uh, whereas before a physical space isn't as necessarily um, accessible to everyone, now there's kind of more of a, like an even playing field as far as like, you, you can enjoy these works um, regardless of whether you live in a big city or regardless if you can get, get access to even go to a space. Um, so I do, I think it's like a double-edged thing where, um, I think it's good that it has like opened up more opportunities, but um, at the s same time, I think sometimes the the sense of like a community of like watching something or um, um, being physically there is it has it has evolved. Let's just say. <laughs> Yeah, and on that note, I'm glad we're all here together. And if y'all have questions for each other, um, I really encourage you to ask it. Um, but thank you, Mateo. And yeah, Kayla, I'm sure you have something um, to say. <laughs> oh yeah, I was just gonna um, say quickly, I mean, it is really nice to be able to share things um, in this way, even though I know like online streaming is always kind of weird. <laughs> um, I did, I did make this originally to be shown with these tents that are made out of the fabric that the people are wearing. Um, so that you're sort of in this like ghostly barrier. Um, but it's kind of the beginning for me in terms of I just finished this pretty recently. So we'll see. Um, but in terms of the, I mean, the pandemic, yeah, I guess it's made art making sort of strange in some ways and that there aren't the kinds of ways of showing that we're used to. But um, for me, video, one of the great things about video is working with other people, which had, which there were, which, yeah, there were lots of challenges in the pandemic, but it also made those relationships much stronger um, because they had, there had to be a lot of trust. And, um, and so, and we did our entire, my entire video outside and it was really cold. <laughs> um, so I'm really um, thankful to the performers for, um, bearing that. And then I just was going to say, I grew up in a place of drought, um, which is San Antonio, Texas. And so I moved to Chicago a little over 10 years ago. 
And for anyone who hasn't been there, it's just like water is flowing everywhere. And there's this like, it's a totally different world. And my brain is still adapting to that or maybe not adapt, but you know, I guess just like, um, so, so yeah, Isabella, it's, I'm glad that you bring this up in terms of this idea of like, oh yes, just wash your hands all the time and do this and that. And we're not thinking about who has access to water um, to do that. But I, but I do wonder in some parts if that's part of my, besides the fact that like Michigan is a beautiful and amazing and sustaining force. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I lost myself there, but. No, yeah, I think that's a, a beautiful point. And I'm also from the desert. I am now currently living in California. Um, and one thing I also thought that kind of united these works is they always felt like on the edge of water, um, you know, not necessarily in it or, you know, not necessarily the absence of it, which I thought was really interesting because my first, here we go again. My first thought is like, almost like water is something that, you know, comes from the sky or comes from below. And in all these works, it was kind of something that we were next to, or, you know, you experienced being next to. Um, and I think that maybe connects a little bit here with Emma's question, which I don't know if y'all can see it, but I'll go ahead and read it. Um, and she says, hello all, this was amazing to see everyone's pieces shown together. One thing that's been mentioned that I'm interested in hearing more about. Working for a water nonprofit, we are oftentimes told we can't be political, 501c3 limitations, uh, but water is literally the most political thing that exists. One thing that's been mentioned multiple times here is control, power, and access to water. Can we touch more on what that means and how that relates to each of y'all, the artists' work, um, and communities, yeah, communities and their work? Um, and I'll just let whoever wants to start, go ahead. Um, I could I could go in a little bit, um, just as in regards to Mexico specifically, um, the country has a really long history of like, kind of like that access and control um, being um, in the hands of, uh, well, at the end of the day, kind of like uh, corporations, like foreign corporations that have um, essentially through the neoliberal policies of the um, governments that have been in place, uh, kind of had free reign to pollute um, a lot of the waterways. And even like companies like Coca-Cola who um, actually um, have taken the clean water sources uh, throughout the country and then sell them, it's like sell it to the population. So like one of the biggest brands is Ciel, which is just Coca-Cola selling water. Um, so it's kind of like, there's a lot of um, scarcity, like uh, access to clean water in a lot of communities. Of course, it's mostly like poor communities. Um, and a lot of the people in um, that community where the documentary is shot, um, whereas before they were more so like, into agriculture and using water to um, irrigate crops, um, especially after NAFTA was signed, a lot of people just ended up selling their um, lands and then moving. So it's kind of like, it definitely is the most political thing like water and who is having access um, in terms of like, usually as far as Mexico goes, it's like um, the water that is in control of indigenous groups ends up getting taken by force or pumped to somewhere else like Mexico City for consumption by the population there. So um, yeah, I think it, it definitely was something on my mind when I was making this film um, to kind of just show what the aftermath of something like this has been for decades there, um, like the imprint. And yeah, it, it's also one of the like, most dangerous countries to like be a land and water defender. Um, so it's kind of like, yeah, there's, there's just a lot that, um, that kind of like goes into the whole infrastructure. <clears throat> yeah, that's a really interesting point too. And I'm thinking of like, even like Tenochtitlan, like the whole, you know, built on a lake and stuff like that. Like that was very much also, I think like an ancient way of attempting to control water that I think is, really interesting to think about kind of as part of this legacy. 
for sure. I just wanted to pipe in in response to that question and kind of thinking of like, you know, places that are, you know, I think Kayla and Isabella both mentioned like coming from places that don't have a lot of water, like scarcity. There's like a strange thing of, you know, living in Buffalo and then also where I live now, which is along the Grand River in Ontario, is that there's so much water, but it's still so dangerous, right? It doesn't mean that you can touch it. It doesn't mean you know, that what comes out of the tap is okay. Like in Buffalo, physically, there are, are parts of essentially the same water system that you can't touch because they're too polluted or they're too rampant with disease at a particular point in time. But then also the infrastructure within the city for a lot of people is, you know, the lead pipes, it's just cloudy, it's yellow, right? So even though it's there and we're surrounded by it, it still is, you know, so much in the power of, you know, who can afford to live somewhere where you can touch what comes out of the tap. And I see a lot of that up here, um, very similarly to what Mateo was saying, you know, um, Six Nations Reservation up here, you know, you can't, you're, you shouldn't drink the water that comes out of the tap. And in certain communities right near wealthy-ish suburbs, you know, it's it's even like, don't touch it. And for some reason, it's within these communities. And then I think Nestle is very well known for um, magically always being near these communities who can't touch their water. And somehow Nestle has plenty of water to pump out and sell. And so, you know, um, I do think it is this tension that I'm always aware of is just because it's there doesn't mean we can engage it, doesn't mean that we're allowed to, doesn't mean that we actually have access to it outside of like a visual experience. Film, there, that's how they tie together, okay. Yeah, that's a really good point. And again, like just speaks to the theme of the exhibition, like thinking about, you know, Samoa and these islands in the Pacific that are, you know, there's obviously, the, the relationship between the culture and the water, but then in many ways, like Kiribati, like the island is shrinking because of the water. And it actually, actually there's a part in Mateo's film where um, somebody's speaking about like flooding and stuff that actually reminded me of Parasite. I don't know if y'all have seen that movie, but the end where like it starts to flood and stuff and it's just like this chaotic, like, you know, metaphor for a million different things, including, you know, capitalism too much of a good thing all that like it just yeah I think it's yeah I, I'm loving this conversation I think it speaks a lot um to that and I'll, Kayla you look like you're oh, ready to I speak was just sorry <laughs> when you said that it just made me because the in that film when it there's the flood it's like um I don't know I guess it's just an amazing moment because it reveals the you know the family's house is flooded and then the dad is driving the wealthy um, other dad around and he's like, oh, I love that this rain has like brought such, a, it's cleaned out mm -hmm. the city and brought such a great smell. And he's like having to, I guess, bear this like incongruity of these two different experiences, mm -hmm. which I think relates a lot to what Jody Lynn was saying. Yeah, um, yeah good point. Parasite screening next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I didn't know if you had anything more to say, Kayla, about that. Um, I guess, Oh, I mean, I guess I'll say it's something I definitely don't address very well in, in my work. Um, so, <laughs> um, but so, I, I mean, I feel really lucky to be in the screening with people who, who do. Um, there is, a, it's interesting, there is a scene that I, because we weren't planning to keep the audio that's live, I didn't keep it, but it's where, and it's not a scene that I showed you, um, but Zhao is showing me through the community garden and then I, real, I wasn't thinking about it, but what we're talking about when I watched the footage is the a thing that the city did this year, which was that they made it really expensive if you had a community garden to have water mm -hmm. directly. Like they made everyone buy this specific, I, I wish, <laughs> I, I'm not near a community garden anymore, so I'm not like as up on it, but they they were trying to make you buy this like specific thing you needed to get the water. And so a lot of people weren't doing it. and so. Um, at the garden in Tilson where Zhao was the, I think someone from the garden was just coming every day to like bring the water or turn on the water, which, um, yeah, I guess there's a lot of, 
politics in Chicago around gardening, public mm. gardening and who, like making it difficult for people to, even though otherwise Chicago thinks of itself as being very plentiful in water and there's, always these things on the radio of like, do we really need to conserve water? Maybe, but you know, like, I don't know. But then there are these, um, all these rules around what you can do with it, how you get access to it in terms of growing food. Um, and then also it, it has to look pretty. Um, so that's a, that's a tangent. Um, but also someone had asked Jody Lynn a question um, Oh right, yeah. It, that I that I also wanted to ask. So maybe I can find it um, in there. Yeah, I think it's from Ima D. Um, and they ask, "Thank you for all your beautiful." Or they say, "Thank you for all your beautiful works." I have a question for Jody Lynn. Can you explain the symbolism of the last portion of your work? Um, and I believe that was the section with like the kind of multiple screens sort of overlapping. Yeah, and because there's where it ended here, and then there's where it ends in the piece that I like edited together for the website, which the final scenes there are actually like my it's slow mo and it's in very close, and it's a close friend of mine, Gaji Gio, holding me because long winded, and I swear it ties into the symbolism is um, I was asked to do a performance, but I found out I was pregnant. Um, when I was supposed to be performing and I was like, mm, that's not a thing. But then, you know, like almost three months pregnant, I was like, hey, let's go to the frigid shoreline of Lake Erie and my partner and my best friend can throw freezing cold water on me. And I was like, I had to really sell them both on it. You know, there's a lot of safety protocols. And, you know, part of that suctioning that I was doing that it ended here was it was like so it's like I exited my body with every single bit of that freezing cold lake water that hit me and I had no idea how to evoke that like in this three channel installation in this quiet space and I was really trying to like in part, like even the power of presumably not toxic water to just snap you out of yourself and into and come back. Like that's the only way I could describe it until it became almost like too much when I had to like just run off. And the final scene that's in the edit that's on the um, on the website, you know, that one was really just the camera was rolling and I was already so cold from having walked into the water. And it was just this sweet moment where Gajitio was just holding me and hugging me. And it really just, I wasn't going to include it, but it was this moment of like, it really reminded me of like, I don't know, maybe a heavy handed, bizarre, like community care that goes on around these things that that we are our own sources of not just advocacy, but really like true care, not just around water. Like it's not gonna come from it, some external spot. Yeah, that's a really beautiful point. And like, I felt that in my bones, like watching your face react to the water, like I could tell it was so cold. Um, but no, I think that's a really beautiful point because um, my family's Navajo, I'm Navajo. And something that we do, like when a new baby's born, like my baby niece, uh, who was just born two weeks ago, um, is that like the little kids get like washed with cold water, right? Or they get, you know, rolled in the snow. And it's kind of, again, these ideas of community care, I think as well as, you know, the lesson behind it is like, you're not the baby anymore. So like, go get tough kind of thing. Um, which I probably need to need to update my cold bath, but whatever. Um, but yeah, like I think that's really beautiful, and you know, it, I think the, the role that water plays in that, especially, um, yeah, it's just it's very interesting. Um, but with that, you know, I, we're at the coming to the end of our time together today. Um, but I just wanted to ask one final question, um, and just you know, what advice which is kind of a kind of a basic question, but to bring it, you know, back to community and supporting each other, just I think film especially can sometimes be this very like daunting medium. Um, and I'm wondering uh, what advice you just have for, you know, 
filmmakers or people who want to work with video. Um, yeah, just in a sentence or two. Um, I would just say, you know, go for it, do it. Don't wait for anyone's approval to go and make your work. Um, find a story that you know, like something, I mean, everyone has their own experience, but I think if you're coming from a place like genuinely that is a lived experience and you are passionate about it, you should do it. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, um, I guess I would say the same thing. And then also, I think, I mean, I guess I'm not part of this world so much, but I hear a lot of times people talking about having like a super nice camera and this, this, that. Um, and I think even when making this project, there were times where I was like, oh, I don't have a super nice camera. I guess it's just going to look this way. And so I just want to also say that, um, you know, you can use anything that you have access to. I know not everyone has a smartphone or a laptop, but if you do, there are usually cameras now there. Um, and I think that it can also be a process of just recording things as they happen in life without having some grand vision. Um, and then I just was gonna, um, because Emma said something very important in the chat that I didn't mention, which is that um, the Chicago lakefront, um, the lakefront of Lake Michigan, which is also made through filling in land, um, which broke the treaty with Potawatomi Nation. Um, so it's a very like, it is a very political and problematic situation in general, but but it's like completely high rised um, until you get to the far north of the city, which is where um, a lot of Anya's scenes take place, which is this like little strip of the lake before you get into Evanston that was had actually started to erode, which is why like no one was ever there because it was roped off um, while we were there. But, and that building actually is now getting sadly demolished and turned into a expensive high rise. Um, but yeah, so it is again with this idea of access. Um, anyway, who gets to have the things? <laughs> um, but I'll go, I'll stop there and Jody can answer the with the question. Um, you know, advice for people, I am a performer who is starting to turn to film. And what I loved about performance was the letting go. The moment starts happening, you're in it, it's going. And so it was important to me to learn about film. It doesn't have to have a perfect vision. It can still be playful. It can still be of the moment. It can still have an experimentation. It can still involve the powers that be external to whatever you think you're going to make, because odds are that's probably not what's going to happen anyways. So just enjoy and trust that letting go. We're not making sitcoms here. Well, maybe, I don't know. Maybe you guys are, but I am not making <laughs> sitcoms here. That's great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, this is, again, just, you know, one of many programs that we've been having. Um, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, The Chapter House. Make sure you follow these artists on their socials. Um, you can find all that information on our website, which is up here on the banner. Um, yeah, we're on Instagram. Get us to a thousand. Um, <laughs> But yeah, thanks everyone so much for joining us. This was a great, you know, a great program. Really happy to have you all here. Um, and yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and I will hopefully see you all in person someday soon. Thanks everybody. Stay safe. Thank thanks. Hola, Nyala.